This week on the CNET Tech Review, Amazon officially enters the tablet wars, learn to live with Facebook timeline, console quality gaming comes to the iPad, and get ready to kiss your texting plan goodbye. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start with the good. Amazon held an event in New York City this week to announce its revised Kindle lineup, including the company's much anticipated entry into the tablet market, the Kindle Fire. Here's Bridget Carey with all the details. Hi, I'm Bridget Carey with CNET TV here at the New York Amazon press conference where not only did Amazon just announce a whole new line of e-ink readers, we also got a look at the Amazon tablet. It's called Kindle Fire. It's a color 7-inch tablet that is at a really low price point, $200. It's a big difference from the Barnes & Noble Nook, which is $40 more. Kindle Touch 3G, Kindle Touch, and Kindle. When it comes to the e-ink readers, Amazon really dropped their prices. Not only is a non-touch version now available for $79, but there is also one touch screen for $99, also much cheaper than the Barnes & Noble version of its Nook Touch. Amazon also has a 3G version of its new touch screen e-ink reader. It's $150, and they're going to be available for holiday, but the one that you can have order now and ship now is the non-touch version for $79. Amazon also unveiled a few new features that really are are important to the new Kindle Fire tablet. You're looking at Whisper Sync that not only does books, but also automatically syncs the kind of movies, TV shows. So essentially, you could take a show you're watching on your tablet, stop it, and play it back on your TV. And Amazon says that worrying about backing up your data is a thing of the past. Everything that you download is going to be stored in their Amazon cloud to be accessed at any time and deleted from the hard drive space anytime but that hard drive is only eight gigabytes. Of course, that's why they're really pushing that Amazon cloud. So essentially, you have all the space you want in the cloud to store things. And Amazon introduced a new mobile browser to its Kindle Fire. It's called Amazon Silk, and it's supposed to make things really a lot faster to load than traditional mobile browsers. Not only are these new Kindles a lot smaller, a lot lighter, but they're also a lot cheaper. Expect them to be a big holiday seller. For CNET TV in New York, I'm Bridget Carey. $79 for a Kindle? That's just like a little more than a couple of hardcover books from your local bookstore. Oh wait, we don't really have those anymore. Stick around for more Kindle Fire details coming up later in the show. Last week, we showed you some of the new features Facebook is working on, including the new timeline, which will dominate your profile page. Well, the timeline started rolling out to the public this week, and Sharon Vaknin is here with a twofer of how-to videos to help you get started customizing your profile and also hiding some of those skeletons from your Facebook past. Hey everyone, I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET.com, here to walk you through the new Facebook profiles now known as your timeline. Timelines are completely different than your profile and they start with a new addition called the cover photo. For my profile, I picked this photo of myself, but it can be whatever you want, like a photo of your dog or your favorite city. To change it, hover over your photo, select change cover, and choose a photo from your Facebook albums or upload one from your drive. Just below your cover photo, you'll see all of your info on the left and other profile items like friends, apps, and photos on the right. To edit or change the privacy settings for any of these items, click on the item. This works for your info, photos, friends, and other modules. You can also decide which boxes show up at the top. Click the arrow to expand, hover over a box, and click the pencil. There is an option to swap the box with something else or remove it entirely. There is a new app called Maps, which is a geographical version of your timeline. It plots points where you've tagged a location in any of your posts. It's pretty cool, but if you think it's creepy, hover over the box and remove it. Now comes the fun and kind of scary part, your timeline. 
All of your Facebook activity is now viewable to you and your friends in chronological order, going all the way back to the day you joined Facebook. In the very beginning, you'll see an empty section for the day you were born. The idea is that Facebook wants you to fill in events that happened throughout your life, even before Facebook. To add an event, hover over the point in the timeline where it happened and click the gray line. You have the option to add a status update, photo, location you visited, or type of life event. For example, maybe you learned a new language, broke a bone, bought a new car, or graduated. There are about 20 different suggested events, but if you want to add something of your own, just click Other Life Event. Once you fill in the information, the story will be added to your timeline and it'll show up in your recent activity at the top. But what if you want to hide some events from your timeline? You might be embarrassed or regretful about things you posted in the past, but luckily, you can hide them. The easiest way to hide old posts is by going to View Activity at the top. Here, you'll see a simplified version of your timeline, which you can filter by type. Once you find the post you want to remove, click the arrow next to the story and you'll see many privacy options. You can hide it from your timeline, change the privacy settings, or delete the post entirely, which means it's never coming back. If you have a lot of old posts you would rather hide, this process might take a while, but at least you only have to do it once. Once you've added and removed posts from your timeline, you can start featuring the ones you want to highlight. Find the post you want to feature, hover over it, and click the star to make it full width. To unfeature it, just click the star again. When you've tweaked your profile to your liking, click the Settings button here at the top and select View As. Then enter any friend's name to see what it looks like to them, or click Public to see what your timeline looks like to everyone, including people who aren't your friends. I know this is a big change, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask me on Twitter or, of course, my Facebook page. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. Hey everyone, I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET.com, here to guide you through all the big privacy changes on Facebook. When Facebook announced Timeline, the new profile design, many people were worried about a change in the Facebook app's policies. Now apps only need to ask for permission once before sharing your activity whenever they want. You can't change the new policy, but you can decide which friends get to see your activity or hide the activity entirely without deleting the app. Go to Privacy Settings, then head to Apps and Websites, and click Edit Settings on the right. Then click Edit Settings again. First, take a look at the list and remove any apps you no longer use. Then find the app you want to adjust permissions for and click Edit. Some apps, like Spotify, let you remove specific permissions, like posting to Facebook as you, so go ahead and remove to your liking. For app activity privacy, pick the people who can see your activity from the pop-up list. If you don't want anyone to see it, click Customize, then Only Me. Back in the Privacy Center, check your settings for how tags work and how you connect to make sure you're connecting with the right people. Once you configure those settings, head to your timeline and tweak some important privacy settings there. Every time you do small things like add a friend, write on someone's wall, change your info, or add a life event, Facebook logs it in your recent activity. If you think that's too intrusive, hover over any story and click the X and select Hide All. Do this for every type of activity you want to hide. To unhide them, just click the pencil, select Hidden Activity, and click the X next to things you want to unhide. At this point, your privacy is already a little more secure, but Facebook buried even more settings we need to adjust. At the top of your timeline, you'll see your general info on the left and some boxes on the right. To change the privacy of your information, click it, hit Edit for any module, and use the drop-down menu next to each item to pick who gets to see it. For the boxes, like Friends and Photos, you have options too. To hide your friends list, click on the box and adjust the privacy settings at the top. For photos, click the box to see all of your albums and adjust privacy settings for each one. Now, back at your profile info, you saw an option for hiding your mobile number. Weirdly enough, if you make it visible to only me, it still doesn't guarantee your privacy. Go to Account Settings, then Mobile, and uncheck the box next to Share My Phone Number with Friends. Now your phone number is private. Once again, Facebook always makes us do more work than we should have to. Once you've got all of your privacy settings sorted out, head back to your profile and click the Settings button, then View As to see what your profile looks like to other users. 
Enter a friend's name to see what info you're sharing with them, or click the public link at the top to see what your profile looks like to the rest of the internet. If you have any other privacy or timeline related questions, leave me a comment on my Facebook page, of course, or hit me up on Twitter. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. So, broke a bone, had surgery, and overcame an illness are all default life event options? Wow, maybe next time I go to the doctor, I can just refer them to my profile instead of filling out the medical history form. Ha ha. If you can't see the timeline on your profile page just yet, don't worry. It's coming soon, whether you like it or not. In this week's top five, Brian Cooley is not only counting down the best free SMS apps, but he's also offering some shocking statistics about your text habits. Oh, <laughs> hi. Texting is huge, in case you haven't noticed. The average American cell phone owner now sends and receives over 41 text messages a day. That's more than 1,200 a month. Try that on one of those 500 texts for $10 plans, and the overages are going to just about double your monthly bill. Now, of course, you can get an unlimited text plan, but I might have some better options. I'm Brian Cooley with the top five SMS texting apps that are both cheaper and more fun to use. They rely on your data plan and don't lean on your SMS count. We're going to rank them by their feature set. Number five is Google Voice. That's right, Google Voice. This app may have the least features of any I'm going to show you, but it does something unique. It assigns you a separate Google Voice phone number. That means you can also text people who are not on smartphones and don't have a data plan, and you still won't be charged for SMS on your end. Pretty neat trick, huh? It doesn't quite make up, though, for other things it can't do, like sending pictures. Number four is Kick. If you're a real heavy texter with like five SMS threads going at once, and you dread that day when a sluggish text app is going to trip you up and cause you to sext a photo to the boss instead of the boyfriend, Kick is your huckleberry. Super responsive and fast. It's also got a cool single letter interface, these little callouts on the bubbles to let you know if a text has been sent, delivered, or read. Great for the obsessively impatient. Number three is called Live Profile. It's interesting in that it connects you to your texting account via an email address instead of a fixed phone number. Makes it great if you use as many phones as you send texts, like some people do. You log in to whatever device you've got via your email address on any of them, and your messages and contacts follow you. It also lets you post your texts to Twitter or Facebook, but doesn't offer group chat, which three of our five do. Number two is Ping Chat. Ping Chat does have the group chat that Live Profile is missing, but it also lets you text pictures while sharing your location and integrating your social network status. That's great because the stalkers union called and they're demanding an easier workload. This is an ad supported app, by the way, and no clean paid version is even available as of this moment. Before I get you to our number one SMS text alternative app, let's get a little reality check on this idea that everyone's texting instead of calling. Nope, we're actually doing lots of both. The latest numbers from the Pew Internet and American Life Survey show that the more you text, the more you call. But the more a person texts, the more they prefer to be contacted that way. So take a hint and stop calling me. The number one SMS alternative app is Kakao Talk. It has just about every major feature going for it. You can send pictures, send video, share audio, do lots of appearance customization to keep you phone fetishists from getting nervous that maybe your phone isn't cooler than mine, and you can password protect a given conversation, like the one between you and Mrs. Jones. But note that Kakao is available on the fewest platforms, just iPhone and Android as of today. All the others add either BlackBerry or Windows support to those two. For the full details on today's great text apps, check out Nicole Cosmos' piece at CNET.com. We've got a link to it at top5.cnet.com. I'm Brian Cooley. Thanks for watching. If any of you are texting as much as Brian says, and I know some of you are, then you need one of these apps. And you should probably consider giving those thumbs a rest, too. All right, we're going to take a break, so if you have any texting to do, now would be a good time. We'll be right back with more Tech Review right after this.
Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good, Angry Birds, Bejeweled, Tiny Tower. These mild-mannered games are fine for passing the time, but every once in a while it just feels good to blow something up. In this week's Tap That App, Jason Parker shows us a game that not only fulfills that need, it looks good doing it. Welcome to Tap That App. I'm Jason Parker, and this is the show where we cover the hottest apps in the mobile space. At this year's E3 Gaming Industry Conference, a certain mobile game quickly got a lot of attention for having console-like graphics, high frame rates, and great-looking gameplay on a mobile device. It was so good-looking, in fact, that many people didn't believe it was a real game for iOS. This week, we're excited to show off Shadowgun, made using the Unity 3D engine and offering a level of graphics not seen before on iOS devices. In our hands-on time with the game, we've been very impressed with the solid controls, crystal clear visuals, and mix of tactical combat and third person action. The storyline is fairly run of the mill. You play as John Slade, a typical tough talking bounty hunter. Your job is to infiltrate a mountain fortress in search of one Dr. Simon, an evil geneticist who has created an army of cyborgs, mutants, and genetically enhanced humanoids. While fantastical in real world terms, most gamers have had their share of chasing crazy scientists bent on world domination. Shadowgun is no different in this aspect. But where Shadowgun differs from the usual fare are the jaw-dropping visuals and easy-to-use controls on the iOS. Shadows and ambient lighting give the game unprecedented realism, and a constant stream of action keeps you engaged as you make your way deep into the mountain fortress. The control system couldn't be easier. You move John Slade with a joypad on the left and look around by swiping the screen on the right. You get buttons for firing and reloading your weapon on the lower right, and you can switch weapons, once you find them, by touching the gun icon in the upper right. But where the control system really shines is in how Shadowgun handles cover. To get out of harm's way, you need only walk up to an object and your character will hunker down automatically. Hit the fire button to quickly come out of cover and take shots at enemies. Pulling back makes you return to a standing position, and pushing forward makes you jump over the object. Other games of this type often have you press a button to go into cover mode, but we really like the simple way Shadowgun handles this tactic. As you progress through the game, you'll need to operate elevators, turn off laser security systems, and operate other mechanisms. Shadowgun keeps it simple by switching your shooting button to an interact button the second you walk up to a machine. We really like these design decisions that make it easy to keep the game fun without a bunch of unnecessary complexity. With all the great things Shadowgun does, like the graphics, the easy to use controls, and an engaging, if somewhat predictable storyline, it does suffer from being a bit repetitive. Each battle follows a similar pattern, Bad guys come out, you go into cover, then you work through killing each enemy one by one. Enemy and weapon variations somewhat make up for this, but you'll still follow this basic pattern throughout the game. Still, Shadowgun is a must-have for serious shooter fans, offering amazing graphics, great level design, and endless gun battles, all with a heavy metal soundtrack. If you like any of these things, we heartily recommend you tap this app immediately. That's it for this week's show. If you have any suggestions, send them to tapthatapp at cnet.com. I'm Jason Parker, and we'll see you next time. $7.99 is a little pricey compared to most of the apps we tap around here, but that's nothing compared to 60 bucks for a console game. Think about it. Okay, now that we've seen the future of mobile gaming, let's revisit the past as we dive into the bad. Retro gaming fans may enjoy playing classic Atari titles like Adventure and Breakout on their handhelds, but they probably miss the classic controls like a joystick and physical buttons. As Scott Stein shows us, Atari's new iPad controller aims to fix that problem, but unfortunately, it misses the mark. I'm Scott Stein, senior editor at CNET.com, and uh, if you're an iPad owner and you're an arcade fetishist, well, you may want to take a look at the Atari Arcade. Sure, you don't have a dedicated arcade joystick for your iPad. You have to rely on touching and smudging up your screen. But there is a solution. The $60 joystick made by Atari docks into your iPad and will allow you to use a joystick and four buttons with Atari's Greatest Hits Arcade app. Just that app, and it docks vertically in portrait mode, and it can't reorient any other way. 
Now, that's a trade-off because a couple of months ago, we also saw another device, the Ion iCade, a giant arcade cabinet for your iPad that used Bluetooth. Now, that one used batteries and could work with several other games in addition to Ataris. This one only works with Ataris, but it doesn't need batteries. Once you plug that thing into your 30 pin, you are set, and this thing is small enough that you can tuck it into a backpack if you so choose to take it around and, I don't know, play arcade games with your friends. Some people might prefer to still go with an arcade cabinet, though. If you're going to take this thing and dock it somewhere on your desk, you might as well go full out geeky. But with this, you kind of got a little bit of both worlds, and as a result, the joystick and the buttons feel a little bit less arcade perfect if you're going to be a real retro perfectionist compared to something like the iCade. Then again, it's a lot better than touching on the screen. But if you're going to put it in that portrait mode, just remember, it's going to shrink down those arcade games, kind of letterbox them a little bit. So unless you're playing a game like Centipede here, which uses the whole screen in order to play because that was a um, original arcade game that used that mode, most of them are not going to take up nearly that screen real estate. And wait a second here, if we're going to be arcade perfectionists, Centipede used a trackball. Wait a second, why are we using a joystick for that? In fact, a lot of Atari's arcade games, Centipede, Breakout, and Missile Command, ones like that, use trackballs or paddles. So next time, Atari, how about giving us one of those? I'm Scott Steinitz, and look at the Atari Arcade joystick dock for the iPad. Have you tried playing Missile Command with a joystick? It's so lame. Though it is a bit better than playing it on a touchscreen. And would it have killed Atari to make the stand also work as a charger too? Man, do I have to think of everything? Well, if that's the case, then I think it's time to move along to this week's bottom line. Earlier, Bridget Carey showed us the highlights from Wednesday's Amazon announcement, but here's David Carnoy with a closer look at the Kindle Fire tablet. Hi, I'm David Carnoy, and I'm here at the Amazon event here in New York City where Amazon has introduced a new $199 Android tablet. It's the Amazon Kindle Fire. It doesn't necessarily look like an Android tablet on the surface. It's got a nice, minimalist, simple interface to it uh, that really attempts to tie in all of Amazon's services. That includes uh, Kindle eBooks, video, MP3 audio, and Amazon's Cloud Drive. The one shortcoming to the device is that it comes with only eight gigabytes of memory uh, and has no expansion slot for more memory. Amazon, however, is touting the fact that you're really going to only store a little bit of content on the device and then delete it and get stuff from their cloud. The tablet comes in only one color, black, um, and it weighs 14.6 ounces. Amazon wasn't giving a whole lot of specifics on the battery life, but I heard from one rep here that it was about seven hours under a worst case scenario where you're playing video. So okay battery life, uh, similar to the Nook Color. It has a dual core processor. Um, it seemed zippy when we saw the demos here. Amazon wasn't letting anybody handle the device. A couple of other key features that Amazon is touting is the new Silk browser. Um, it's a mobile browser that's supposed to be a better mobile browser with caching that allows pages to load faster. There was some talk of even being able to predict where you were gonna surf. For instance, if you went to the New York Times website and you ended up going to the front page and it knew that you were going to the business section a lot, it would preload the business section for you. The other feature that Amazon was touting is that WhisperSync uh, not only is available for eBooks now like it is on other Kindle devices, but it's also available for video and audio. So everything syncs wirelessly with this device similar to what's going to happen when iOS 5 comes out with Apple. Unfortunately, you cannot get this today. This won't be out till November 15th, but Amazon is already accepting pre-orders and expecting a lot of people to do those pre-orders and is apparently making millions of these. One of the key headlines here is that this device costs only $199. Uh, Amazon was expected to come out with a $249 Android tablet. Coming out at 199 obviously makes this even more attractive. Um, some people are calling it a Nook Color competitor. Some people are calling it an iPad competitor. And obviously, for those people who don't want to spend five to six hundred dollars on an iPad, this becomes a nice alternative. And it's also smaller and more pocketable. Until then, it looks like, on the surface at least, Amazon has really put out a product that a lot of people are going to want this holiday season. I'm David Carnoy. 
and that's the Amazon Kindle Fire. The bottom line this week, the Kindle Fire is en fuego. I know it's not even Halloween yet, but whatever. I hereby predict that the Kindle Fire, and all the new Kindles actually, will be some of the biggest holiday sellers of the year. All right, that's going to do it for this time, everyone. But come back next week for an all-new CNET Tech Review when we will have all the news from Apple's October 4th iPhone event. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. I'll see you next time, and thank you for watching. Thank you.